Good evening and welcome to a special U.S. National Team edition of Across the Pitch. We're the soccer show for people who think Vandedonk is the name of a bad country song. <laughs> oh, that was good. I, haven't, I didn't hear that one before we started, so that one was good, man. <laughs> 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 yeah, now, uh, of course, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys look up the uh, country song if you're so inclined, but Vandedonk is Danielle Vandedonk of the Netherlands national team. It, who does she play her club football for, Matt? Oh, man, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Let me look it up real quick. Uh, oh, that, that, that's all right. I, I was only asking you because it's Arsenal. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. I did not know that. The Arsenal women's team. All right. You know yeah. what? As I'm looking over this roster, there is a lot of that Netherlands team that uh, plays plays for Arsenal. Yeah, there there really is a lot of the, the Netherlands team that plays throughout Europe, and, and it's really impressive if you look at their lineup. And of course, the Netherlands national team took on the U.S. women's national team, and we were pretty happy with the, the result of yesterday's World Cup, weren't we, Matt? Yeah, I think it's hard not to be. I mean, you got to be stoked that we won another World Cup, uh, but I think going into it, you ask any U.S. supporter, this was the expectation. Um, I think once we were got past France in the, the quarterfinals, that pretty much sealed it for me. You know, you had a couple great teams uh, in this tournament, and it really shows that the women's game is just growing across the globe. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to be the first person to say that. So so tonight, and uh, real quick, my name is Phil Kennedy, and I'm here with Matt Robards tonight. Uh, Aaron uh, is unable to join us. He will be uh, joining us again shortly. Uh, but today, me and Matt are, are jumping on to recap what was one of the biggest days in the history of U.S. football, because not only did we have the U.S. women's national team winning their fourth World Cup second in a row, but we also had the U.S. men's national team, who just a year ago couldn't even qualify for the World Cup, made it all the way to the final game of the Gold Cup against Mexico. And where I was going with this is, I'm going to say that I watched both of those games yesterday, and the, the women's game was by far the more exciting of the two games. Would you agree with that, Matt? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it's, I didn't get to watch all of the women's game. Um, I got to watch a little bit of it kind of live, and then I had to watch a lot on replays. But it, it was definitely an exciting match. Uh, hats off to the Netherlands. Um, they came, uh, they pushed that team, but it, it was a great game. It really was. In in Netherlands, I, I really think that, that they were kind of overlooked as being the European champions. Uh, of course, Germany got knocked off a little bit earlier than they were expected. They were one of the favorites. And then after the U.S., it seemed like everybody was really talking about France and, and England. And then, uh, like you said, once they got past France, and then especially once they got past England, everybody was kind of penciling in the uh, the U.S. women's national team. But then what ended up happening was on Wednesday, Sweden, who has kind of been the U.S. rival, they ended up finishing third, which I believe was actually their third consecutive third place finish at the World Cup. They lost to the Netherlands, who nobody had really kind of looked at, but they went into that final game had, having only conceded three goals the entire tournament. And like you said, if you look up and down their roster, you see not only players for Arsenal, you see that they have players playing for Olympic Lyonnais, the uh, the Champions League, uh, I believe five-time Women's Champions League winner. Almost every player on the uh, the Dutch team is playing for some kind of a European uh, powerhouse or or at least the IX uh, Women's uh, Dutch League team who, you know, obviously we know what a powerhouse IX is at the, the Eredivisie, so... Uh, you know, there's a lot of talent on that Dutch roster. The the other thing that, that I had noticed uh, is that 
Uh, so the, the Netherlands, they actually made their first appearance in the Women's World Cup in 2015. They made it to the round of 16, got knocked out there. I noticed that there were players who are still maybe 27, 28 years old now that played a prominent role for them in 2015 that aren't even in the roster. So that that really just shows how far the, the Netherlands national teams come in the last four years. Yeah, I mean, again, this is just speaking to the growth of the women's game um, across the world. I mean... You know, we, this this year, for those of you that don't know, the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup actually increased the number of finalists from 16 to 24. 2015, you had 16 teams in that competition. Now there's 24, and you got a lot of these teams that are, you know, you, you have those teams like Thailand, obviously, that, you know, are still kind of behind the eight ball. They're best players playing over here for uh, a college uh, but then you have these teams like the Netherlands and England and these teams that are slowly catching up to the U S as far as development goes. And I'm actually, I actually think that this might be the last world cup that the U S goes in favorites. I, I think the rest of the world is catching up that quickly as far as the development of the women's game. And I think this could be it, man, this, this might be the last world cup that we're, we're confident that the women are the best in the world. You know, I was already going into this one kind of wondering if some of these other teams had caught up. And, and that was, well, we'll get to this a little bit later, but when I did write my article, I kind of wrote it towards the the idea that what are the scenarios where the, the women's national team could lose under. And what I really took away from that final game is certainly it was tied at halftime. But by the last 10 minutes of the first half, you could see they were really getting the pressure on yeah. and that it was just a matter of time and, and they were just the, the superior club. And so what I would say is for this World Cup, they still are a tier above everybody else in talent. Right. I think they proved that in that final game where I, I wasn't sure if, you know, maybe they were all the same tier as some of these other teams. They prove that they're a tier ahead in talent. However, what you're looking at is four years from now, that's going to be four more years for these other countries to catch up. The other thing that you have to look at is how much turnover is there going to be on the roster? I mean, this was the last World Cup, certainly for Megan Rapino. Probably Alex Morgan, maybe she's on the roster in four years. So there, there's going to be a lot of turnover. Uh, but then, uh, then you also see that that there's some young players coming up. Why, why don't uh, Why don't you tell us about some of the the upcoming players that, that you think are going to be there in 2023? Yeah, I think right off the bat, the biggest one for me is Rose Lavelle. Um, you know, she mm -hmm. had a great tournament. Uh, she, you know, she came out, um, scored the second goal um, in the 69th minute. So, you know, Megan Rapino gets the uh, 61st minute penalty. U.S. gets up, you know, all of a sudden the Netherlands have to react to that and push to, you know, now push. And then Rose Lavelle pops up, gets the ball in midfield, dribbles a nice little run and just just a great shot. And so I think for in four years, she's going to be at the prime of her career. She'll be 28. Um, mm -hmm. She'll have, you know, four more years of, of national team duty under her belt. And I think she's going to be um, excellent. Uh, in four years, and she'll be kind of the backbone of this team. Um, the interesting... It almost felt like a, a passing of the torch, didn't it, when she scored that Yeah, goal. it kind of did. You know, I mean, I think um, it was just, it was such a good run, and you kind of saw her confidence. Uh, you mm -hmm. saw some of the early games. I think she was trying to get used to, to playing. She was trying to get her feet wet, you know, first World Cup. And so there was a little bit of maybe a hesitation on her part. And certainly by the final, you saw that she had uh, that, that confidence. You know, she was backed by the manager. She's obviously backed by her teammates. And so she was, she was just uh, unstoppable on that run. And, and you just saw that drive and determination. So I think in four years, she's going to be, you know, one of the best in the world if she continues at that rate. Um, I think the position for me, though, that's kind of crazy to look at is, in four years, what is this? What is our forward situation going to look like? So mm -hmm. as I look through this roster, Carly Lloyd, thirty six. You know she's probably not going to be there in four years. Alex Morgan, thirty. You know she'll she'll maybe be 
an off the bench player. Tail end of her career. Right. Then again, Megan Rapino is thirty four this year, so I mean that, that's the same same age. And I kind of covered that in my article is that Alex Morgan actually celebrated her 30th birthday during the World Cup right. on July 2nd. So she'll she'll really be 33 coming into that run up. The, the thing about her is she's already accomplished so much. Is she going to maybe just say, you know, a year or two from now, call it a career? I mean, she's she's playing with Orlando right now. She's not over with a European giant or, or anything like that. It just feels like her career is kind of winding down, maybe. Right. And then I think the other position that's kind of interesting is the, the goalkeeping position. Mm-hmm. Both of, you know, Alyssa Nyer, the starter, 31. So in three years, she's 35. You know, Ashlyn Harris is 33, the, the backup, you know, so in four years, she's 37. Uh, and then the other goalkeeper on that that roster, Adriana France, is 28, and she has one cap. So in four years, is she the person that's going to be taking this over? Or is someone else going to come through? You know, you got a lot of aging defenders, midfielders. So, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, man. Like, there's going to be a lot of turnover by the time this U.S. women's team uh, gets back together to defend their title in four years. And that's four more years that people like the Netherlands and England, uh, France, you know, have Germany have used to develop their game even more, mm-hmm. especially as we're seeing larger clubs in, in Europe pour money into the women's game. I mean, Manchester United just launched their women's team this past year, already gained promotion. Uh, we'll be playing in the top division in the women's league this coming year. You know, of course, you got City and Chelsea and Arsenal. You know, you got the big German teams, Spanish teams are, are pouring money into theirs now. So the Spanish team is starting to get better. It's going to be an interesting Women's World Cup in four years. Oh, absolutely. And just kind of circling back to one thing while we were talking about goalkeepers, this was kind of a, a technical question that, that I wanted to ask you about. Now, uh, first of all, but before we started this, we've had a long running joke about uh, how I struggle with Dutch names on the show. And uh, now, of course, we're, we're playing the Netherlands. Oh, by the way, hey, did you hear that Arjun Robin retired? I did, yeah. That was interesting. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, the, uh, the the Dutch name that I'm about to botch is Sari Van Vienendal. Uh, yeah. Did, yeah. Did I, I get that one that. all right? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so now now she's the the Dutch goalkeeper who uh, had a fantastic tournament. She actually won the goalkeeper of the tournament, well-deserved, only conceded five goals the whole time, two of those, of course, at the last game. But the technical question kind of that I wanted to ask you, and now I I know that, that you didn't necessarily play goalkeeper, but, you know, you certainly have some experience being on the field. And when Megan Rapino hit her penalty kick, it absolutely froze the goaltender or the, the goalkeeper. Yeah. Van, Van Vienendal did not move. What 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 do you think causes that from a goalkeeper? Do you do you think that's something where mentally the goalkeeper just kind of freezes up, or do you think that that's something that uh the the striker could bring on in the way they strike the kick. How, how, how does that, that happen? Because that's something that, that always kind of gets me when I watch it. You just see a goal, goalkeeper just stand there and not move. It. And what, what do you think is going through the goalkeeper's head, or what do you think causes that to happen? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different factors that can lead to that. Um, first, it, you know, penalty kicks are, are a chess match. You have the kicker, uh, the taker is trying to wait until the last minute to see where, if the goalkeeper is going to, you know, going to signal, you know, by some sort of little movement, which way she's going to dive. Conversely, you have the goalkeeper waiting for the, the taker to maybe square their hips a certain way as they approach the ball to say, okay, she's going to my left or the right. So then they're looking for in each other for these little things to kind of give away where the ball might be put. And so when you have a goalkeeper going up against Megan Rapino, you know, obviously she was the best player in this tournament. Um, I think Megan Rapino can do such a good job at kind of hiding or tricking the goalkeeper 
and placing her shot where she wants it, that the goalkeeper is sitting there waiting for something to cue her to say, okay, I'm going to go this way or this way. And when that doesn't come, then she's just in that moment of, of waiting, essentially. And so there is no reaction. Um, and so I think that's what leads to it. So you're, you're saying that it, that it is something where the, the kicker could just hit it so perfectly and not have any tells more so that it is the goalkeeper just having a mental lock at that moment. Right. Yeah. I, th- I think you got a, someone like Megan Rapino, who again is um, exceptional player at what she does. Uh, oh, you yeah. know, again, what she won the golden boot and the golden ball at this World Cup. <laughs> yeah. They, they showed so, she had a, a picture. She had more trophies in hand. So, right. so <laughs> you know, and, and then you have someone like um, Vanderdahl, who only has, you know, 50 something caps, you know, was, was kind of playing backup for most of her career. And now she's sitting here in front of this, you know, World Cup final, probably plays into it. But I think Megan Rapino is so good at just not giving a tell. And she can square her body up a certain way and play the ball the opposite way that it just causes that goalkeeper just to freeze because they're waiting for something to tip them and that something doesn't come. Excellent. Uh, that's that's perfect. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And, and I think that uh, you laid that out perfectly. And so, uh, so did you have anything else that, that you wanted to touch on before we move on to the, the game that didn't quite end the way we wanted it to? Yeah. I mean, you know what? I, I, I just, again, I, I think it, it just can't be said enough just how much that this Women's World Cup showed the growth of the game. I mean, here, you, you know, 2 0 doesn't tell the whole story of that final. Um, So just running through some of these stats, possession, 54 to 46. Mm -hmm. Uh, Netherlands held their own with the U.S. for for a lot of this game. You know, 390 passes for the U.S., 345 for the Netherlands. So again, it's not like they were getting outpassed. Pass accuracy, uh, 68% for the U.S., 63% for the Netherlands. I mean, so you just see that the the women's game is growing. and, and while the U.S. are still the dominant team, I mean, four Women's World Cups, uh, two back-to-back hasn't been done since Germany, I believe, um, you know, in the early right, 2000s. Right. It, I, and I, mean, it and I an think that the, these two, the, the level of play for these two is much higher than it was when Germany won their two. Correct, yeah. I mean, so, you know, just all around, it was a great game, great tournament. Um, you know, and I, I think for those players that have been around for a while, um, you know, Becky Sauerbronn, um, Kelly O'Hara, you know, just kind of looking through this, um, Ali Long, Carly Lloyd, Megan Rapino, Tobin Heath, Alex Morgan, you know, just Kristen Press, it's, you know, they, this is well-deserved um, for them to lift a second World Cup trophy and certainly etch their names in probably one of the best women's teams, uh, you know, in, in history. Um, so proud, proud to be an, you know, an American, um, so stoked for them. Uh, but four years, uh, I'm really excited for that women's world cup. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, like you said, I mean, with the two in a row and the competition being at the highest level it's ever been at. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to mark this down as one of, if not the the greatest women's team of all time. Now, five years down the road, we'll probably see another team that's even greater, and, and that's just the, the way that the game's growing. Right. What we're really hoping is that three years from now, before the next Women's World Cup rolls around, that when the next Men's World Cup rolls around, that the, the United States is a part of it, uh, and, and in the recent Gold Cup, they, they definitely look like they're headed in that direction. W- wouldn't you say so, man? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, again, this is the great thing about watching international soccer is, you know, when those World Cup cycles roll around, you know, we say three years till the next men's World Cup, but really World Cup qualifying starts in a year, mm-hmm. you know, because you got that two-year process to qualify. So. Uh, you know, it's, it's an exciting time, especially with, uh, Burhalter, you know, just really starting out his, his coaching position. So now the, the game that happened yesterday, of course, was the, the final game of the gold cup where the, the U S was defeated one zero by Mexico. It was a, 
a close game by all accounts. The uh, U.S. certainly had their chances where maybe they could have equalized or, or even gone ahead early on. But from what I saw in that game, it, it did look like the better team won. That being said, second best team in CONCACAF. I, I don't think that, that that would be a bad place to be considering where we were at a year ago. Right. I mean, it, it, again, it's such a tough thing because we should really be the second best team in CONCACAF, you know, just kind of based off of the other teams around us. Um, you know, th- for the past, you know, f- three, four Gold Cups, you know, Jamaica's looked really good. Um, Panama has kind of been a thorn in some people's sides, but they've, they've seemed to drop off, you know, a tad. Um, so that's really where we should be. Um, I think the disappointing thing about this loss is this is the sixth time we've played Mexico in a Gold Cup final and the fifth time we've lost. So we've only beat them once in six tries in a Gold Cup final. And that's just not, that's not good enough. It's a tough pill to swallow. And I, I think, I think Greg Berhalter got outcoached by Tata Martino. So now, now with Mexico, you are talking about a team that made it to the round of 16 in the World Cup. So, I mean, there, there are no slouches. Do you think that, that man for man that uh, the U.S. matches up with Mexico and it is a matter of outcoaching? Or do you think that Mexico just has a, a more talented roster right now? Um, I mean, so, you know, you got two nations that have two new coaches. Um, Greg Berhalter got introduced in December of 2018. Tata Martino got announced a month earlier, or I mean, a month later in January. Um, so you have that. I think actually man for man, the U.S. Mexico are pretty even, you know, just kind of running through off the top of my head. I would take Zach Steffen over Guillermo Ochoa. Uh, I would take our center. I would take Aaron Long over both of the Mexican center backs. You know, I would take uh, you know a guy like Reggie Cannon, who who seems to be playing really well at that right back position. So I think you can go through. Obviously, you know, I would take Jonathan Dos Santos over um, Michael Bradley. Um, right. So I or think actually you, Jimenez over Christian Pulisic probably. Well, I mean, that's two different positions. You know, Raul Jimenez, and i take Jimenez over Altidore, for sure. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was just trying to compare their Premier League guys, I guess. Right, yeah. So I, I think if you look just position for position, it actually, they stack up pretty pretty easily. Now, Mexico was without Carlos Vea, who's been, you know, he has 19 goals in the MLS you know, on pace mm-hmm. to break right. the all-time, you know, the single-season goal-scoring record. You know, they didn't have Chucky, uh, Lozano, uh, uh, Chucky Lozano, who plays for PSV Eindhoven, um, who's just a great winger, you know, probably up there with Pulisic. Um, but I think if you look at this, you know, just position position, they're actually pretty even. Um, and I would say Burhalter got outcoached in the tactical decisions that Tata Martino made at halftime. You were mentioning the substitutions last night. Did you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where, where I'm speaking to this. So, you know, you have, so just a couple things that Tata changed at halftime was we saw Christian Pulisic get man marked in the second half. And so that significantly cut down on what he was able to do. And then we saw Mexico push higher up the field, almost counter pressing the U S Okay. And so the U.S., once they got the ball, had less room to turn over. It had less room to work with. And we were then getting overpowered in the midfield. And so the first sub to me just made no sense because you take off uh, Jordan Morris, who's playing right wing, and you put in a guy like Christian Roldan, who normally plays in a center mid position, and then he, he was playing in a, in a right wing position. But that didn't help us in the center of the park. We were getting overrun you know, we had, we had a two man midfield against a three man midfield. It doesn't take a lot of thought to say that we're going to lose that battle every time. Right. And so that didn't make sense to me. You know, if, if that's what you want to do, then you needed to figure out a way to drop Jordan Morris into the center midfield. Um, and then maybe put someone out or, you know, change the formation up somewhat, maybe go uh, like a four, two, three, one to give you that extra man there in the midfield. 
Um, and so I, I think just those tactical adjustments shows where Greg Burhalter is, is kind of still lacking and still growing in his understanding as a coach. And then I just had, you know, I, I think the Altador Zardes substitution was, was coming. Um, but with what they did before with Roldan, it just didn't make sense. Uh, and then the, the, the substitution that just caused, you know, PTSD for me was bringing on Daniel Lovitz for Tim Ream when you're down a goal, left back for left back. And I just had flashbacks to the FA Cup this year when Chelsea's down against uh, Manchester United 2-0 to zero, and Sari takes off Azpilicueta and puts on Zappacosta. And it's like, dude, what are you – you're down a goal. Like just throw – you know, why not throw Tyler Boyd on? You know, take off Tim Reed, throw Tyler Boyd on, change the formation, go three at the back. And then if Mexico gets another goal and we lose 2-0 – I'm I'm all right with that as long as but we were going at least we were going for it. Right, exactly. We've talked about this before where in a knockout tournament or certainly in a championship game, you need to coach differently than you would in a league game. In, in a league game where, you know, maybe goal difference is something you say, okay, you know what, let's put on this defender and, and just lose by one and, and not kill our goal differential. But if it's a knockout tournament, it doesn't matter if you lose by one or you lose by 12. Right, right. I mean, you still lose, especially in a final, right? Yeah. So again, it's like, okay, take off Reem. You know, maybe he just wasn't doing enough. Maybe he was tired, whatever it is. But go to three at the back. Put Tyler Boyd on. All of a sudden, you know, stop trying to play out of the back. You know, that that's great if you're just trying to hold possession and win the game. Or, or you know, it's, it's just a, hey, maybe 1-0 is better than losing 2-0 for goal difference. But, you know, go switch something up. Launch balls forward over the top. Our best attacks – our best scoring opportunities in the in the first half came off direct balls. You know, one over the top, Altador brings it down, holds off his defender and lays it off to Pulisic. And the other one was, you know, over the top on the Altador's uh, foot and he gets one-on-one with the goalkeeper and, and whiffs on it. But our best chances came from that direct ball. And so it's it's why not just go for it? You know, you're down 1-0 one, one with – uh, you know, 17 minutes left to play. Yeah, throw the plenty of time. out there. You know, I mean, the, what the the last sub came in the like the 82nd minute. Yeah, I, I want to say yeah, uh, 82nd, 83rd minute. Let's go around for it there. at that point. You're talking eight minutes. Just throw everything out there. This is a final to win a trophy. A major trophy. It doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter. Just went, but I again, I think that's where you see the inexperience of Burhalter compared to a guy like Tata Martino, who has coached at you know Atlanta United, won MLS Cup, he's coached in Argentina. I mean, he's just coached kind of all over the place, so it's like mm-hmm. he knows he just has this understanding. And so, I, I again, we just got out coached. Now, one one thing that I did notice, and, and just kind of going back to what you said about best chances, one thing that I saw, especially in the second half, is that it seemed like a, a lot of their best chances were coming off of corner kicks. Yeah. And it it's it almost seems like the the U.S. part of their strategy is to try and win corner kicks. Like, yeah, I, I've seen them like, you know, try and kick the ball off the other guy's leg to make it a corner kick. Is this really part of their strategy? You know, I don't know if it's it's necessarily a, like a, a coach strategy in the sense of Greg Berhalter says, hey, when you get in this position, try this to win us a corner. Uh, I think it's kind of just a natural player thing. When you're on the touchline, you, you, know, you have a defender close for you. You really have no other options. Let's try to play it out for a corner, and then we set up a higher probability of a scoring chance based off that corner. Especially when you have guys that are are really good in the air. You know, Aaron Long mm-hmm. had you know, had a couple good, you know, had a header. Um, you know, Matt Miazga scored with his head. You know, you have guys that are good in the air, so why not uh, go Weston for it? Weston McKinney had a, a header in the Champions League, uh, right? Weston McKinney. Year. I mean, and when you got a guy like Pulisic who can put in a good good cross why not give it a go but unfortunately you know that one 
you know, we had the one chance at that and Mexico had their guy on the post and that's why you do it. He gets, he gets the clearance and, you know, unfortunately we're not able to capitalize, but you know, yeah, it's just, we're game just where, every, every belt seemed to go Mexico's way in that game. Right. And it was just another instance, man, of, you know, Tato Martino made changes that changed the game. He managed those and Greg Burhalter, um, I think was trying to be too, too tied to his system. And I think as a coach that that can, that can come back to hurt you. Um, I mean, we see it all the time with, you know, coaches, you know, in, in different leagues across the, the world that are so tied to a system that it works for a while, but once teams figure it out, uh, then it's kind of just hard to get away from it. Uh, it's like in, in baseball when uh, a pitcher uh, goes out and gets lit up and then uh, the manager runs that same pitcher off the next day and everybody at the, the stands is like, no, not him, he needs a day off. But then the coach, you know, hard-headed, no, this is a guy we pitch in this inning and he goes out and gets lit up again and everybody at the stands knew it was going to happen kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's very true, man. I so when I saw that jersey, I was uh or I'm sorry, when I saw that lineup, I was kind of shocked at some of those choices. You know same but. lineup two games in a row. Uh now now that's just actually something I was gonna ask you about. Do you think that Burhalter is going a route of just playing who he thinks are his best 11 guys regardless of position that, that's almost kind of what it seems like to me i don't know man see that's tough because you know you had a guy like tyler boyd who uh, seemed to be the starting right winger scoring goals you know dribbling creating chances and then he doesn't play for two games you know he gets and so i i don't i don't know i don't because I, I would say out of those players, Tyler Boyd is a best 11. I would play Tyler Boyd over Jordan Morris. Um, but maybe Tyler, Tyler Boyd wasn't playing the system that, that Greg Berhalter wants to play. Um, Greg Berhalter could wants Tyler. Could he been nicked up maybe? Or? I, you know what? I mean, that's the thing. You know, and it's, it's always tough when you're sitting on this side of things because you don't necessarily hear or see what goes on in practice. You know, you know if he's – kind of banged up and but they're that's not disclosed you know outside of this you don't see that and so it's tough to say i i don't know what burr halter's doing uh so now let me ask you this and this this might be something that you know the answer to i know for instance in the the national football league in american football that if a player is injured the team is required by the league to list them on the injury report Right. And then if they find out afterwards that the guy was hurt and didn't get listed, the team can get fined. Is there a similar rule like that in in uh, soccer or, you know, at least in international? Not as far as I know. Um, you know, I, I think uh, unless it's a major injury, I don't think they necessarily have to say anything. Well, you know what I mean? I think we, you know, I've, I've experienced this a couple times. I've seen it a couple times this season with our local team, Phoenix Rising where we'll have guys who, you know, I know have knocks. Um, and then the injury reports that I see, they're not listed on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I don't, I actually don't think that that's a requirement. Yeah. I think it, it comes down to, uh, to gambling. And the, the, the thing is that, uh, you know, soccer obviously is something that that's heavily bet on, especially in, in Europe. Right. So, so that's why I was, I was wondering about that. Cause I, I guess it's one of those things where, you know, if some guy gets insider information that player X isn't going to play, then they can go make a big bet on it or something like that. So. Right. Yeah. It's interesting gamesmanship, though, because, I mean, certainly for me, if I was coaching a team, I wouldn't want to let my opponents know who was hurt or not before the game unless I had to. For sure. Yeah, no, I agree with you, man, because you want them to prepare for, you know, who they think might be out there and... Um, right. Why but, not have them prepare for a guy that, that's not going to play and then they've right. wasted half hour of their practice. I don't time know. The shots you saw of, of Tyler Boyd sitting on the sideline didn't make it seem or look like he was injured. He, you know, I didn't notice, you know, him with tape up, up, you know, anywhere or um, he was certainly dressed. So I, I just think it was a decision of, 
you know, Jordan Morris does play, does do what Greg Berhalter wants done in that system. And Tyler Boyd looks to be a little bit more selfish and maybe Berhalter doesn't want that. But in a game again, where you're down one zero, you want to throw on that guy who's going to say, all right, I'm going to take on a couple dudes and I'm going to, I'm going to rip off a shot. Cause you're just hoping that something goes in. I mean, again, this is, this wasn't a friendly, you know, and, and, it, and it kind of felt like the U S approached the game like that a little bit. Um, you know, watching the Jamaica game, the semifinal, I felt like the U S almost approached that more of a final than they did this Mexico game. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it seemed like there was, there was something, something was missing where I don't know, maybe they just, you know, they, they were beaten before they even came into the stadium, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Cause I mean, it, you know, they, they played well enough to, you know, it's not like they came in and got run out of the building or anything. Right. But yeah. I mean, they just, it, it was like, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, Mexico got a little bit chippy. They were getting in people's faces. Uh, you, know, you didn't really see anybody from the U.S. team go up and get in a Mexico player's face or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it's um, – I, I just – I don't know, man. It's, it's just disappointing, you know, especially I felt like we were – I mean, Mexico struggled this, this tournament. They, they did. You know, they struggled against Haiti. They struggled against Costa Rica. Um, it felt like the U.S. was the better team. I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it was certainly there for the taking. But, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to go back to what I said, you know, uh, from not qualifying to the World Cup to second place by 1-0. I'll, I'll take that for a year's growth. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully it continues and we qualify for the next World Cup. I can't imagine uh, what would happen if, if we failed to qualify again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to have uh, Burholter's life insurance policy. I know, right, man? That's, that's crazy. <laughs> but uh, other than that, man, it was a great day of soccer. I think we'd be, uh, you know, we just got to say congratulations to Brazil for winning the Copa America. Um, yeah. Hosting it, winning it. Danny Alves, 36, but just played played a great tournament, played a great game. Another uh, trophy for Allison. <laughs> yeah, another He's trophy for Allison. Up. You know, I mean, just overall, uh, congrats to Brazil uh, on winning the Copa America. First time, I think, in 12 years that they won that tournament. You know, that's uh, that's actually probably a good thing to wrap up with because we, we did talk about uh, the, the two games that the U.S. was involved in pretty deeply. And, of course, you just mentioned the uh, the Brazil game. There was a little bit of controversy about having the three big games on the same day. Personally, as a fan, I loved it. What do you think about that, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, so the thing is, is there were three games in one day. I thought it was great. One was in the morning, one was in the afternoon, and one was at night. So it worked out perfectly. You yeah. Know, um, had the U.S. women's game been scheduled at the same time as Copa America, you know, I could see a little bit more of, uh, mm -hmm. hey, that's that's kind of messed up, or you know, if the women's World Cup final game was the same time as the Gold Cup final, you know, I could see that. But having three finals spread out across the entire day, I didn't have an issue with it. I thought it was great. You know, it was a good day of soccer. All three were great games outside of the U.S. just losing. Um, and yeah. so, again, congrats to the women for uh, lifting a second uh, women's World Cup trophy uh, in, you know, back to back champions. Congrats to Brazil on the Copa America victory. And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess congrats to Mexico on winning the gold cup. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, congrats to all the teams that played yesterday because every team, uh, you know, whether it was the, the winners or the losers had to beat some pretty tough competition to get to where they got to in those respective tournaments. And like I said, I mean, it, it was a great day to be a soccer fan yesterday and a great day to be an American soccer fan. And, and once again, like Matt said, congratulations to the women's national team, two World Cups in a row by far the the most dominant team in the tournament 
And after watching that, I, I don't have much doubt that if they played that tournament five times, that, that they'd probably win at least four out of five. Right. Agreed, man. So it was a good day overall. Absolutely. You got anything else tonight, Mr. Wizard? No, I'm good, man. I'm, well, you know what? I do got one more thing. I'm excited yeah. to have Junior Flemings and Kavon Lambert back with Phoenix Rising after the Gold Cup. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the team's been on such a roll, and now they get back arguably two of their five best players, and uh, I, I think that, that they're ready to just uh, hit the second half of the season, which kicks off this Saturday, yep. is it? Yeah, this Saturday. Yeah, yeah Saturday. Uh, is it El Paso that they're playing? Uh, no, they are playing Rio Grande Valley Rio Grande. Toros, or I don't, I don't know what they're called. But what, what are those Texas I-10 teams? Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll stop at whatever or other way. There you go. <laughs> Thanks again for uh, tuning in with us here tonight on Across the Pitch, and we'll be back with uh, another episode shortly. And uh, have a great night, everybody, and Mr. Wizard. Have a good one, Phil. Have a good one. See you guys.